Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Ted, and thank you to ARM for sponsoring this program. Uh, so Viasite is a company, we're based in San Diego. We're focused on, in the regenerative medicine space, on stem cell replacement therapy, uh, allogeneic stem cell replacement therapy, as you'll hear. We have a, the company's been around for about 10 years, we're private. We have a very accomplished team of leaders in this space, about 60 employees in the company, and we've developed over the years two novel platform technologies that we work from. One is the directed differentiation embryonic stem cells, and as you've already heard in the first couple presentations, the key isn't the ability to differentiate a stem cell. The key is the ability to differentiate it in a scalable fashion, in a regulatory compliant fashion, so that you get to the end of the day uh, with each manufacturing run with the same cells, the same product to move forward and to be able to show that to the regulatory authorities. And so that platform represents uh, over almost 50 issued U.S. patents, uh, over 100 patents issued worldwide that cover various steps along that path. The second platform is a macroencapsulation cell delivery technology. And this is because we start with an embryonic stem cell, uh, a single source of cell, so it's an allogeneic transplant. So while they're human cells, when we put these into a patient, it's not the patient's cells. And therefore, we need a technology to protect them against any immune rejection. So that's the second part of the platform. So we put these two together to uh, produce our first product called VCO1. And it is a combination product. It is a stem cell derived islet replacement therapy for uh, insulin dependent diabetes. Our initial focus uh, for the program has been on type 1 diabetes, but we do believe it has application for insulin dependent type 2s as well. Uh, we are in a clinical trial now called STEP 1. Uh, it's a uh, phase 1 2 trial looking at the uh, safety and efficacy of the product in patients with type 1 diabetes. It's the first embryonic stem cell derived therapy for diabetes to reach the clinic, so we're on a, a steep learning curve as we go forward with this product. Uh, and it has the potential to provide what we would call a, a cure, a functional cure for type 1 diabetes. If it works in humans the way it has in animals, patients would no longer need to worry about uh, regulating their blood glucose, injecting insulin, et cetera. So a clear and substantial commercial opportunity. The idea of using an islet replacement therapy is not new. Um, it's actually been around for a long time using cadaver islets under what's called the Edmonton Protocol. And under this protocol, uh, islets are uh, harvested from pancreas of cadavers. It takes about two to three pancreases to treat a single patient. Uh, but it's very effective, and you can have cure rates, uh, very high cure rates out at one year and even at five years, a substantial cure rate with uh, this, this procedure. The problem with it is it requires uh, chronic lifelong immunosuppression for as, well, as long as you've got the product in. Uh, it's a, a very limited source of cells. The cost of therapy is very high, and it's an invasive procedure. So we're hoping with VCO1 to address all of these. So VCO1, as I said, is com combines these two platforms. One, we go from an embryonic stem cell up to a pancreatic progenitor cell or pancreatic, a collection of pancreatic endoderm cells. These cells are at a stage where they will continue to differentiate in vivo to become islets. Uh, and we then put that into the device, the encaptor device. This is placed under the skin. The cells then continue to differentiate over a two to three month period, and by the end of that period, they're producing uh, insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, all of the factors that are commonly associated with an islet. Um, we have uh, shown that uh, this is a very effective in the animal models. We are, had, went to the I FDA last year. We had very good relationship with the FDA on this. We, uh, it's a very complicated product, as you can imagine, but we got approval of our IND in 30 days, uh, and we launched our first trial at the end of last year. So the trial itself, it's a phase one, two trial, as I said. It's open label. Right now, we're in a first cohort. Uh, this first cohort is a subtherapeutic, and it's really designed to show the safety, of course, 
but also to allow us to perfect the surgical and post-surgical procedures that are going to be necessary to get a good engraftment. Even in the animal models where we've perfected this over years, we lose a substantial number of those cells post-implantation. They then re-proliferate and fill the device, but the, we want to minimize that loss as much as we can. So we're doing lots of work right now on the surgical procedures. But once we have that perfected, then we expect to go to a cohort two, which is 36 patients, and there we will look at both safety and efficacy. Uh, we'll do an efficacy analysis at six months, but we will continue the treatment for two years because we also want to know how durable this is. Uh, one exciting aspect of this program is the endpoints. The sentinels give us an early, we put, are putting in sentinels, which are a small cell-filled devices, this what we use in the mice. These are being planted at the same time we're implanting the therapeutic devices, and these get withdrawn periodically, and we will do histology to look at cell viability, vascularization, cell differentiation. Um, so that will give us an early evidence for activity. It also gives us a way to, to really perfect these surgical treatments and such as we go through the trial. But once we get to the second cohort, we're looking at both safety but also efficacy, and that's one of the advantages of this program, is efficacy is very clear. We'll look at insulin production, C-peptide levels, and also secondary endpoints of insulin dosing, uh, the requirement of exogenous, obviously what we hope is they will no longer need that exogenous insulin, and frequency of hypoglycemic events. So I'll stop there, and uh, we'll talk about some questions. Great. Great. Great, Paul. Please come join me. So those slides are really helpful in terms of describing the product VCO1. As you mentioned, this is a uh, com combination product. And I guess before we get into the uh, ongoing clinical study and some of the learnings there, maybe tell us about some of the work that you and the talented researchers at Viasite have done in terms of optimizing these cells and really optimizing the Incaptra device itself um, in order to really maximize this interaction between these cells and the device. Right. Well, and, and it really is two different parts to that. One is the cell, and a lot of work went into that whole process of going from an embryonic stem cell, which we harvested back in 2005, came from a vitro fertilization clinic, um, and then we have banked, and we have developed uh, master and, and multiple working cell banks. And that gives us a, essentially an unlimited supply of this particular starting cell. Uh, but then it's going from taking that out, we take that out, we go through a, uh, about a, a uh, one-week procedure of scaling that from millions to billions of cells, essentially. Um, and then we go through a proprietary process that takes about uh, two weeks to go from various steps of optimizing uh, and getting out to the final product, which is our pancreatic progenitor. And all along the way, we have various steps of, of testing and, and uh, release assays that uh, ensure that we're getting to the right place. Uh, we also look at the end to show that we don't have any embryonic stem cells left in the preparation because we don't want to actually implant the stem cell. We want to implant these differentiated cells. The, the device part of it, of course, is, is very important. Um, we based this on a previous work that had been done in this field with macroencapsulation devices. Baxter did work with Theracite device early on. It never was put into a commercial product, but has been used in a lot of research programs. So there's a lot of data on the abilities macroencapsulation devices to protect cells against allogeneic and auto um, rejection. And this work is in across from small animal rodents up to primates, even some hu limited human studies. So we based our work on that and really focused more on making it a commercially acceptable device that would work with our cells. That's helpful. Now in the slides you showed us the design of the step one study. <clears throat> And you do have some patient experience now. So what can you tell us about your learnings from implantation in the first few patients? And how should we expect data to ro roll out from the, uh, from the study? Sure. So currently, we, only ha we have enrolled four patients into the study. Uh, we're getting ready to enroll our fifth here. And interestingly, I would say that the surgical procedures and such have um, uh, 
been changed on each and every patient. And, and that's just a reflection of the learning curve we're on right now. And, and that's without necessarily um, specifically data. As we put these in, you can imagine that what we're looking at is, is to maximize the engraftment of these cells. And so the way this procedure is done, we're putting these right now in the lower back. The reason we choose that location isn't because that's the only place we can put them. We put them there because these patients are still injecting insulin, at least for the several months they will be continuing to use insulin. And uh, so we needed to, we've shown in cadaver studies with this device, it's very robust. It will withstand things like a equivalent of a 50 mile an hour baseball hit over to direct, directly onto the device. Um, but it will not stand up to a needle. So we're putting in places where they don't typically inject. So, um, you know, we're learning the, this, as I said, we're in this first cohort where it's sub-therapeutic, so we're not expecting to see any efficacy in this, in this uh, group of patients. Uh, but we are pulling these sentinels, and we're starting to get data back from the sentinels, and that will give us an opportunity to, to really look at, you know, where the placement is, where they're low up in the up their fascia or the muscle, uh, various aspects. So a lot of learning going on, a big learning curve. Yeah, as you described it, a steep learning curve. So I guess maybe kind of thinking sort of further out, how long do you believe VCO1 needs to produce insulin and control glucose in order to be a successful product? How would you define that from patient feedback and interactions you've had? What do you think defines a successful product? Um, yeah, it's a great question. It's probably a, a question that may be answered differently by payers and patients. Patients will tell us anything that gives me relief from this disease, even for any period of time, is, a, is a, you know, very important to them. Um, but I think realistically, what we've seen in the animal models is we've been out the life of our animal, which is a mouse, and it's only about a one-year lifespan on these mice that we use. Um, so we've been out the, to the life of the animal, and it's still functional. So we at least out one year in the animal models, it's a functional. We don't know what it will be in patients. Uh, we're hoping it'll be in the neighborhood of two to three plus years, uh, possibly more, uh, but that's what we'll find out. I think as long, it, there's another part of this, which is what patient population are you talking about? So um, we are right now in stable, well-controlled type 1 diabetics, but we hope to move into a, a trial fairly quickly as soon as we've established safety and, and preliminary efficacy. We plan to initiate a trial in a subgroup of patients called hypoglycemic unaware patients. This is a, a group of patients that are, are very, uh, don't get any of the typical signals you get when you get into hypoglycemia, represents about 20% of the type 1 diabetic patients, so a large population. And the problem with these patients is they have about a six-fold greater uh, chance of going into a severe hypoglycemic event, severe meaning if there's not somebody else in the room with them, they can die. So, um, you know, that patient population, obviously, the bar becomes very lower. Anything that can reduce their insulin usage, uh, even for any period of time, is going to be a big benefit. That makes a lot of sense. And obviously, time will impact pricing. Um, with the minute and a half that we have left, uh, the FDA is in the process of formalizing the procedure of expedited review for breakthrough status. Do you think VCO1 could qualify? And how could this impact your regulatory strategy uh, uh, to get to the market. Yeah, so the FDA has been using the breakthrough product designation for a while now, but they're now going back and, as you said, formalizing their their view on, on how that would be um, utilized. Uh, I think it's uh, certainly something we've been focused on from the beginning with uh, when we first started the regulatory process here. And it goes back again to we've had some discussion whether the program as a whole could be a breakthrough product. But what we focused on mostly is this hypoglycemic unaware patient population. So the reasons for going in that patient population are a number of reasons. One, they ha have a desperate need, and we think that uh, we can be very helpful in that patient population. Um, two, as I said, the, the bar is somewhat lower. You know, we don't know how effective our product is yet. We hope it will work in all patients, but, uh, you know, the bar certainly in them is lower. And three, we believe we can get breakthrough product designation. And we have had some discussions with the FDA on this 
this patient population. They're clearly very interested in, in finding approaches for it. Uh, right now, there are no treatments other than just monitoring. There was a New England Journal article on the impact of uh, hypoglycemic awareness, not just on the patient, but on the families and the, imp the really negative impact that has. So we think that's where we can get a breakthrough product designation. Makes a lot of sense. Paul, we probably could have talked for another 15 minutes, but I know we're out of time. I want to thank you very much for being here, and uh, thank you all for joining us.